Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing cargo jet stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Cargo jet is a cargo airline. It operates cargo services mainly in Canada, but internationally as well. Its base is in John C. Monroe Hamilton International Airport. The company is headquartered in Ontario, Canada and was founded in 2002. It started trading in 2005 and can be found on the TSX, OTC, Deutsche Börse and Munich Stock Exchange. It was established in 2002 from the cargo operation of the defunct Canada 3000 airline. And also in 2002, it acquired Winport Logistics. In 2019, it announced a partnership with Canadian rapper Drake, naming him an ambassador to the brand. CargoJet has the only national network that enables next day service for over 90% of Canada's population. It has a fuel efficient fleet serving 16 major airports throughout Canada. E-commerce has more than doubled in Canada since 2018. It is also growing in every country. As this segment gets bigger, CargoJet will be even busier delivering all those packages. It receives a guaranteed revenue stream since 75% of its revenue is from long term contracts. It works with some of the most well-known delivery companies like UPS, DHL, and FedEx. It has partnerships with many small, medium, and large airlines. Its fleet size should be 27 Boeings by the end of this year, 30 next year, and 32 the year after that. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 3.3 billion market cap. They're trading at 192 a share, and they have 17 million shares outstanding. We're going to look at the ticker of the trades on the TSX, so all the numbers in this video are in Canadian dollars. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they did generate positive free cash flow for the first time in 2020 and it grew a little more in the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was negative in 2020, positive every other year. Revenue is a sales for the company and that's grown a lot from 455 million to 706 million. 2020 was its best year because a lot of people didn't want to go out so they had packages delivered to them. Also there was a lot of medical items delivered through companies like CargoJet. So their business boomed in 2020 during COVID. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that more than doubled from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. Then below that is operating expenses. Depreciation is a big operating expense for this company. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income. And that almost tripled from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. They paid $39 million of interest on their debt. But they are paying down their debt. They did pay $44 million of interest in 2019. The only reason their net income is really low in the trailing 12 months and negative in 2020 is due to this large negative in other income and expenses. I would ignore items and other income and expenses because they're non-recurring. I would just focus on operating income. That's a better indicator of how well the company's doing. So you can see their revenue and their EBITDA has grown a lot since 2015. This is their revenue, the red line. It grew from 289 million to 706 million and their EBITDA grew even more from 36 million to 301 million. It makes sense for the EBITDA to grow more because once you pass that break even point, then the growth in your bottom line is more exaggerated. Let me show you what I mean, because the top line of the income statement is their revenue, and their revenue grew 55% from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. Their gross profit grew 135%, and their operating income grew 187%. As you get lower on the income statement, the growth is more exaggerated. It's a lot easier to grow operating income than revenue, because in the first few years of operations, most of your revenue is going towards expenses, so you have very little operating income. But as you cover your fixed costs with your revenue, then your income grows even faster. This is a company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You can think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash. Because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So it is good to see that they're generating positive operating cash flow from running their day-to-day -day business and it's growing it more than tripled from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. But they have a lot of capital expenditures because those planes are pretty expensive. They spend at least $150 million a year in CapEx. You can see in 2018 and 19, operating cash flow minus CapEx gave them negative free cash flow. So they added debt that year to fund their CapEx. But in 2020, they had positive free cash flow. 
So after buying more planes, they had money left over. And it looks like they repaid a similar amount of debt as they had in free cash flow. They repaid 248 million of debt and they issued 110 million. So they added almost exactly 146 million. That's what you want to see as the company has excess funds, they pay down debt. They also pay a small dividend payment out to its shareholders as well. This is the equity section of their balance sheet and they raised $655 million from selling capital stock and they lost $57 million from running their business. Retained earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes minus the sum of all your dividends you paid out. So I do expect their retained earnings to be positive by the end of 2022. It looks like they're headed in that direction. Let's look at the capital structure. 600 million of equity, 440 million of debt. They're 58% equity, 42% debt. And their weighted average cost of capital, which is a blend of the cost of equity and cost of debt, is 6.77%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's 5.6 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $5 billion. We divide that by 17 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 290. They're trading at 192, so they're trading at a 34% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. The way I estimated their future free cash flows, I grew their trailing 12 month free cash flows by 10% each year up to 2024, then grew 2.5% in perpetuity. I think that's a reasonable estimate. At the pace they're growing, I think they can grow even more. So it definitely seems like a good undervalued stock. Simply Wall Street is even higher than me. They're at 354 a share. They're saying the stock is 46% undervalued. Nine analysts priced the US stock and their average price target was 196. They're all saying the stock is undervalued. This stock has done really well since it IPO'd in 2012, especially during coronavirus. It had a huge run up. It did pull back because a lot of times when a stock runs up really quickly, people take in their profits and a stock goes down. But it seems to be coming back up. I wouldn't be surprised if the stock price broke through 250. That's at all time high. So it does look like the stock price has fluctuated the past 12 months. And every time there's a news story about an analyst upgrade, the stock price goes up or an analyst downgrade, the stock price goes down or when they partner with Amazon, which I believe that's their biggest customer. So when there's a story about them doing work with Amazon, the stock price goes way up, but then people sell off after a few days. You really have to ignore the short term fluctuations in the stock. If you really feel bullish on a stock, just buy it and hold it. And they raise their dividend each year from 18 cents up to 26 cents. They pay a one half of 1% dividend yield. I would ignore the payout ratio because they had such a small amount of net income due to that large negative other income expenses. I would focus on the dividend over free cash flow and they paid out 11% of their free cash flow. So they had 89% left over to buy more planes. So they definitely can afford to maintain and probably grow this dividend in the future. And their industry pays a 1.7% dividend, so they're a lot lower than their industry. They have a low beta, 0.59, so the stock is not too volatile. The stock has not done well relative to the S&P 500, up 16%, the S&P is up 36%. The 52 week low was 160, the high was 250. And the stock is in an uptrend since it's trading above its 50 day and 200 day moving average. And this stock doesn't get too much action. Only 100,000 shares are traded each day. Most of the shares outstanding are on float. 44% are held by institutions and 1.5% of the shares are shorted. This stock has crushed it the past three years and five years, up a lot more than its industry and the market. Analysts are forecasting their earnings and revenue to grow more than its industry, but less than a market. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $180,000 today. Not many people will put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago because it wasn't too well known. And when your $10,000 was $15,000 or $20,000, you probably would have sold off because you would have been too scared that it would have came back down. Of course, when you look in the past, it seems easy. Maybe one out of 1,000 stocks would do this well in 10 years. And the Royal Bank of Canada is the biggest shareholder, 10.4%. Then U.S. Global Investors, Manulife, British Columbia Investment. Then The Case, which is the second largest pension fund in Canada, owns almost 3%. Let's look at their financial ratios. Their P.E. looks really wacky because they have such low net income, so I would ignore this number. They have a decent price to sales ratio of 4.7, so investors are paying $4.70 for $1 revenue. They have a great return on invested capital of almost 15%. They can cover their interest payments four and a half times. They have a low ROE due to low net income. They have a high current ratio and quick ratio. They have over $200 million of cash on their balance sheet, so they do seem to be well capitalized. They had $160 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months and almost $150 million of working capital. Plus, they pay out about $18 million in dividend payments, so they have $289 million of excess funding. 
The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of four other companies in the same industry as Cargo. And if Cargo has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're a lot worse in PE and price of sales. They're better in price to book and current ratio. They have a bad ROE. They're a little lower in depth than average. And when I convert all the market caps to Canadian dollars, they're by far the smallest company and they pay the smallest dividend payment. To summarize, I have them trading at a 34% discount, but this company seems to be doing really well. It's finally hit the point where it has positive free cash flow. So that means the free cash flows are gonna grow at a more rapid pace. And delivery is a really important thing, even more so now during COVID. Something like COVID is gonna accelerate the delivery business, especially for companies like this that could deliver medical supplies overnight. The only issue is this company doesn't get that much visibility. It's not a big name like UPS. So those really big banks or those big funds don't watch a stock like this. It may get traction in the near future, but right now there's not many shares that are traded each day. Just because a stock is worth $100, for example, doesn't mean someone's willing to pay $100 for it. If you list your house for $500,000, and if no one offers that price, the highest offer is $400,000, that's what your home is worth. It's not worth $500,000, even if you think it is. So even if you think this stock is worth $1,000 a share, it doesn't mean it'll go there. It could go there in the future, but many, many other people need to feel the same way as you about that stock, that it's really undervalued and it's worth $1,000. But if this company keeps growing and they have several billion dollars in revenue, then they'll start to get a lot more notice. I rank their free cash flow 7 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratio is 4 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.